when I was asked to <coughs> introduce this morning's speaker, I got pretty excited because Scott Todd and I have uh, spent some time in the last few years traveling together and on several occasions have roomed together. So I asked Mary Lou if she would send uh, Scott's bio to me so that I could do a proper introduction. And when she sent it to me, I read this. <coughs> Scott Todd received his PhD in immunology from the University of California in 1996. Following his doctorate, Dr. Todd accepted a fellowship in oncology at Stanford University Medical Center, where he was the National Lymphoma Foundation Scholar. Do you know what that means? When we were rooming together, <laughs> and I was trying to figure out how to short sheet his bed, <laughs> or put Vaseline on the doorknob, he was trying to figure out how to cure cancer. <laughs> Priorities. What you may not know about, about Scott is that he actually uh, is an inventor of a U.S. patent for hepatitis C. And I'm not sure if that means every time somebody gets hepatitis C, they've got to send Scott a quarter. <laughs> or if it's about the treatment for hepatitis C. Maybe he'll explain that to us this morning. But would you join me in welcoming my friend, Compassion Zone, Dr. Scott Todd. Good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you this morning, and uh, when I learned that Jim, Jim was going to be introducing me, I have to say I did get a little bit nervous. Wasn't real sure how that was going to go. I still haven't got his quarter yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really excited to be here this morning. I've been looking forward to this chapel for some months now um, because we get to talk about releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name, and you guys have seen this. Uh, this continues our theme on releasing children from poverty. And we really want to ask, what does it look like to see a child released from poverty? If we could see that child who had been released from poverty, <laughs> what would he look like? We have outcomes, you know, ideal outcomes. Physically healthy. I think you can note the glow. We need to come back to that. You can, you can note the glow of physical well-being here. Demonstrate self-confidence. This is a man who knows who he is and where he's going. Huh? As for cognitive development, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, I love Jim, and this was a fun time we had in Australia. Jim loves technology. He discovered that technology uh, there in Australia. He got a lot uh, more relaxed when he realized he could still breathe through his mouth. <clears throat> hey, here's a, an interesting bit of news uh, from Bucharest, Romania. <clears throat> just all headline news correspondent. Some would-be thieves in Romania carefully studied their victim, the time needed to steal the money, how to grab the money bag, and planned the escape route. They failed to plan, however, the amount of fuel their car would need for the perfect escape. <laughs> Police say a 27-year-old Romanian thief was arrested shortly after his getaway car ran out of fuel after just a half a mile <laughs> into the planned escape route. Reports say the man snatched the bag containing $37,800 from the front seat of a car in Bucharest, Romania, then jumped into a waiting car driven by an accomplice. You know, think about that. The accomplice is sitting there in the car waiting for this guy to do the job, and what is he looking at? He's got half a mile worth of gas. Uh, you know, that's just, it's kind of funny and painful. I found that on dumbcrooks.com. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Well, it turns out that dumb crooks aren't the only ones who suffer from that kind of affliction. Rocket scientists and, uh, and those types do as well. Um, none of us here. But, um, you know, Mars. Uh, it's been very important to us to discover whether there's water on Mars. And uh, I think the idea here, I'm not, you know, into Mars myself, but I think the idea is once we completely waste our planet, we can go there to live if there's water. So it's really important. And uh, back in 1998, we had this plan, that is we, NASA, and all the jet propulsion rocket scientists, to do a one-two punch exploration of Mars. We had two vehicles. The first one was, was going to launch off of this, this uh, impressive Delta IV launch vehicle. And this was December 10th, 1998. And that vehicle was to carry the Mars Climate Orbiter, which is a, a gadget about 1,300 pounds of the latest, greatest technology loaded onto the top of this rocket that would then launch to Mars 
and its trip was going to take it about nine months. And uh, shortly after that launch, a second vehicle was to launch, the same type of rocket, but it was carrying a different gadget called the uh, Mars Polar Lander. And so together it was, you know, about uh, $400 million worth of investment and all of those PhDs and, and their white lab coats and, and rocket scientists had made the plans and invested the money and the launch day came and both vehicles successfully launched. The, the uh, climate orbiter was on its way traveling 571 million miles uh, through space to its destination in Mars. And when the polar lander, when that rocket, I, I'm sorry, when the uh, orbiter was to arrive, it wasn't going to land, it was going to use aero braking and use the friction of the atmosphere there to slow itself down and enter into orbit. And it was carrying things like the pressure modulator infrared radiometer. <laughs> it should hit the marker head on, deploy a parachute, and then uh, it would kind of slow down, it would kick out these little retro rockets, and then sort of gently guide its way down to land on its targeted landing site, a place to put a robotic arm and scoop up some soil and blast it with a laser and then transmit the data back to the orbiter which would send that data back home. So after uh, nine and a half months and 571 million miles, the NASA teams and all of the uh, media and uh, the, the administrators were all standing around and waiting for that first vehicle to arrive and, and be orbiting Mars here and pop out its antenna and call home. Well, the day of that arrival came and went, and uh, it never called home. <clears throat> well, as it turns out that the two teams working on this, the navigation team uh, in California, went back and looked at their calculations, and they realized something important. They had used meters, and the Lockheed Martin team in Denver had used feet. So after 571 million miles, it all burned up in the last mile. But all hope was not lost. We had contingency plans. The scientists had these options uh, for allowing that landing vehicle, the polar lander, to actually transmit data directly back to Earth. And so all eyes and all hopes turned to the, uh, the second vehicle, the Mars polar lander. <clears throat> So it was still traveling at 12,000 miles an hour en route to the red planet. They expected the, uh, the lander to uh, touch down in the Sea of Tranquility on December 3rd, 1999, and at exactly 12.39 p.m. it would call home. But 12.39 p.m. silently clicked by. Now, <clears throat> the project manager, those of you in project management will appreciate this. I won't name his name, but at the Jet Propulsion Lab there at NASA, He's quoted on uh, December 3rd, the day uh, that the landing was supposed to take place and they didn't hear any uh, telephone call from the gadget. He said, I am very confident that the lander survived the descent. Everything looked good. I think we're a long way from getting concerned. It's not unexpected that we wouldn't hear from it in the first opportunity. So this was his opinion on December 3rd. Well, at the same time, there were some guys back at NASA looking at pictures of the landing site. And they sent those pictures over to the team and. Uh, the project manager was quoted as saying, hey, look at that hole. Because it turns out that the Sea of Tranquility is not so tranquil. There's a mile deep canyon right in the middle of the landing site. <laughs> so after another 571 million miles of travel on this arcing path all the way to Mars, it comes down to the last mile. If you can't land it, don't bother launching it. If you can't finish the job, you may as well not spend all that time and money. We're talking today about finishing. And this is really all about CIV, because CIV is about completing Compassion's core program. CIV is not a core program, but it exists to support the outcomes for child survival and for child sponsorship and for leadership development. Now, to understand what I mean by this more specifically within the world of CIV, I have a little visual aid. To the health professional, to the health professional, this is what hope looks like. This is what the answer looks like for children who have HIV. They call it antiretroviral medicine. We tell our kids that it makes HIV go to sleep. And this little pill, for its development, had a decade of research in the United States and in Europe, lots of money, lots of labs to produce this. And then from its point of manufacture in South Africa, or India, it may have traveled by train 
by ship, by plane, by, by all kinds of transportation, maybe finally on the back of a bicycle, bouncing down the dusty, rutted road to a remote clinic. And in that remote clinic, it sits in a jar on a shelf. And I'll just use this as my shelf over here. That's the journey. You might say that that pill has traveled a long way. It's had a long, hard road. It's traveled 10,000 miles. And now that is celebrated by the international uh, communities that work on uh, treating AIDS as success because that jar is called access. But that jar uh, and, the, and the, pill that the, little, the journey that the little pill had is nothing compared to the journey of a little girl that I was privileged to meet a few years ago named Caroline. Caroline was born in the eight by 10 foot dwelling that she lived in in uh, her slum. Uh, her mother went into labor in the middle of the night and in her slum it was not safe and just not possible for her to make the, uh, the walk to the clinic, which was a long way. And so Caroline was born uh, there in her slum and her mother did not realize that she was infected with HIV. And her mother didn't realize that there were fairly simple things that could be done to greatly reduce the chance of her baby becoming infected with HIV. And even if she had known, even if she'd known her status, even if she'd known that there were things to prevent the transmission of HIV, she wouldn't have believed them possible because those kinds of things aren't for her. That's holding out hope, and hope cannot be so recklessly spent when there's so little of it in the heart. So Caroline grew up knowing her mom as, as we all, many of us knew our moms, as a provider, as a nurturer, as one who cared for her and loved her. But Caroline will never forget the day that her mom began to fall sick. First she started coughing, and then uh, the coughing became just constant. She started losing weight. She was tired all the time. She began to get scabs and sores on her skin. And so this woman who once cared for Caroline now was withered and frail, and Caroline uh, was in that situation where she became the one who was caring for her mom, cleaning up after her mom when she had no control of her bowels. Things that no little girl should ever have to go through. And during that time, the other kids in her community stopped playing with Caroline. One little boy even yelled at her, You got AIDS! Go away! And that echoed in, in Caroline's head. And then she had to witness that night when that weak, familiar coughing just stopped. And she woke up, and no matter how she pleaded with her mom, her mom was not coming back. So she sat there, as alone as any person could possibly be. Now the next morning came, and uh, Caroline's grandmother took Caroline. And so Caroline moved in with her grandmother in the same slum. And two years went by for that little girl, who usually played alone, until she herself began to fall sick. And the, the taunting accusation of that boy echoed in her head. You got AIDS! And she didn't want to believe it because she knew that that's a death sentence. She once got the courage to ask her grandmother, why did mommy die? And her, her grandmother quickly said it was TB, tuberculosis, and then walked away. Her grandmother had seen too much of this way of death to believe that any other outcome was possible. And in, 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 in living a world shaped uh, by that hardship, had assumed the same thing would be true for Caroline. You see, that jar may have traveled 10,000 miles, but it needed to travel 10,001. And that last mile, the mile into the broken heart of a nine-year-old girl living in a slum who's lost her parents is a long, hard mile. And we have to ask, what does it take to care for little girls like Caroline? What does it take to go the distance for them. What is it going to take to walk the last mile? Where do you find the people who have the compassion in their hearts? Where do you find the people who have the courage and the strength to carry joy into dark places like that and who have the sensitivity to enter into the broken world of that little nine-year-old girl? Where do you find those people? Because that's a mile that our weathered healthcare heroes cannot afford to walk. 
They've stayed at the post in those clinics, but they simply don't have the capacity to go out into the alleys and into the slums and, and visit with little girls like Caroline and her grandmother. Where do you find those people? They're already gathered. They gather in those little slum rooms. They gather in the city centers. And they gather even in the forests. And they gather to sing praise to Jesus Christ. And they gather to pray for each other and to pray for their hurting world. They are God's people. They are his church. It takes the church to go the last mile. It takes his people. It takes followers of Jesus Christ doing ministry the way Jesus did it, holistically. I submit to you that there's no other organization on earth with the capacity and the calling, with the manpower and the mandate, with the credibility, with the endurance, and with the passion to go the last mile. Now we have over a thousand little girls and boys who are living today and doing well because they're on antiretroviral therapy. These are kids who were born with HIV like Caroline, and Caroline is among them. She's doing well, and I was, uh, it was just a joy and a privilege for me to get a little bit of time with her. And that's a remarkable thing to be able to say today because we couldn't have said that not long ago because it hasn't always been this way. Some of you may remember the early years of the AIDS initiative, not so long ago really. You might remember a little girl named Jacqueline. I shared her story last time I spoke. Jacqueline's a little girl who had HIV and in those early years we were really struggling in Tanzania to get that therapy available to kids and uh, Jacqueline was one of the first on the therapy but we were too late and she passed away. On that same trip, I mean, this was really a brutal trip for me. I, I first went into Kenya. This was February of 2005, and I uh, met with some of our kids who were um, suffering from some, some situations there in Kenya. A, a kid named uh, Eric who had leukemia, and I'd seen quite a bit of that. Another kid named Edgar who had a different form of cancer. And there was a little boy named Jack Tone uh, who had a kidney problem, and he was on dialysis. And after that, I went down to Tanzania, and I met Jacqueline. Well, it was that same time that I met this little boy whose name is Isaac. And now, it just seemed to me that every night I'd come home and I would cry. And I would pray to God to give me strength just to carry me through another day because the things that were happening on that trip were day after day getting harder and harder. And then the day after I met Jacqueline, I met Isaac. Now, Isaac, his story is very similar to Caroline's. He... Uh, you know, born in a slum, never knew his father, witnessed the death of his mother, and his mother died of AIDS. And when I asked him, uh, how are you doing in school? He said, um, well, I don't go to school. I said, really, why not? He said, I'm already smart. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> I have four boys at home. <laughs> I know where he's at. <clears throat> so, uh, he is just a smart little guy, you know, um, a neat little guy. Uh, but he was, uh, he was nine years old at the time that I visited him. And just shortly before my visit, some neighbors had caught uh, some other neighbors in the act of sexually abusing Isaac. And that that had been going on over a period of time. You see, when, when his mom died, he had no one left to care for him. He was in an extremely vulnerable situation. Now, he had an uncle... And the uncle said, well, you come live with me. But the uncle was an alcoholic. And so the uncle was basically never around. Now, on that trip, after, after meeting these kids and, and seeing Isaac, I have to tell you, I, I was full of anger and frustration and sadness. And I didn't really know, you know, what's the outcome here? How's this going to work? You see, the church had actually mobilized to arrest this perpetrator. And he was arrested. But the next day, the Tanzanian police released him on quote-unquote bail. And it turns out bail in Tanzania doesn't actually require any money. So that when I was there, this predator is still loose in the slum. And I can only imagine that he was probably filled with a lot of anger. And I could only imagine where that anger would land. So I returned home to Colorado. And even during my return and shortly after I, I got back, Jacqueline had passed away. Edgar died, Eric died, Jack Tone died, and Isaac was still alive, but he was in such a vulnerable situation that I have to tell you, I prayed for him, but I don't think I had very much faith. A lot has changed since then. A lot has changed. I've already told you that we have a thousand kids 
in the AIDS initiative, because of the AIDS initiative, which is a CIV, we have children who are alive today and doing well. I'd like to tell you about some more progress in our medical fund. Uh, another story about a girl named Babirie. Uh, Babirie is an eight-year-old girl, and she's from Uganda. She has a twin sister. Um, but Babirie has always been weak uh, and small for her age. And she suffered constant chest pain and shortness of breath, and uh, she hasn't been able to play with the other kids. And uh, she's, in, in the report that I read, she um, is described as not being a favorite at home. Her healthy twin sister is the preferred child. But what her family and the other kids, and even Babiria, didn't know is that Babiria was born with a hole in her heart, a literal hole in her heart. And uh, that's something that I've actually seen quite a bit of. When I was in graduate school, we work in collections, holes between the different chambers of the heart. And so uh, not, a, not, a, not a t an unusual situation that she would be born that way, but to have lived that with a hole in your heart, you will not live. You go through the growth period, and then uh, that'll be it. So that hole was detected during one of Compassion's routine medical screenings. You know that kids receive, before the age of 12, they receive twice a year medical checkups, and after the age of 12, once per year, like a physical exam. And so, uh, because a qualified person was doing this exam for Babiria, they discovered this, and they referred her to specialists, and the specialist said, she needs open heart surgery. And we don't have that surgery in Uganda. We can't do that in Uganda. So, what did we do? We did what compassion does. We went the last mile. We took Babirie to India, where there is the Madras Medical Mission, and they specialize in open heart surgery. So we flew her all the way there, and she underwent open heart surgery, and it went well, and she recovered there, and she's now returned to Uganda. And I'd like to read the quote uh, as she's recovering now. This, this all happened just a few months ago. The quote uh, on her update says, she is doing well, she's able to run and play netball without fainting, she attends school regularly, and she's gained weight from 19 to 22 kilograms. Because of the surgery, hope was restored in the family. Love and care are now given equally to the two twins. This is what it takes to go the distance for Babiria. This is what it takes to treat Babiria as if she was our own daughter, as if she was your own daughter. This is the medical fund. This is CIV. But Babiria's story is not unique. I wish I could tell you about Aganira, a 13-year-old girl, also from Uganda, has a similar defect in her heart, a structural malformation, needed open-heart surgery. She was also flown to India for open-heart surgery, did well, is recovering in Uganda. I'd like to tell you about Sarugo, a little boy same type of condition, this one probably caused or made worse by uh, an untreated infection, underwent open heart surgery, returned to Uganda, is doing well. I'd like to tell you about Kembambazi, an eight-year-old girl that needed heart surgery, and about Mudondo, who's the same story. These are five kids, all from Uganda, and all just in the past few months, for about $60,000, uh, uh, flown to India, underwent surgery, successfully recovered, are now doing well back home. That's five out of 25 kids that have undergone open heart surgery just from Uganda alone. I'm telling you about going the last mile again. I'm talking about Uganda, Compassion Uganda, going the distance for these kids. It didn't matter that they looked at the fact that Uganda doesn't offer that surgery and said, oh well, that's the culture. No, that's the culture of poverty and it's not acceptable. And these kids for about $10,000 each, they could live a complete, full, healthy life. That's what it takes to go the distance. Now, uh, just a few uh, months ago, I was in Tanzania again. And um, another area of CIV that I'd like to tell you about is one we used to call orphans and vulnerable children. Now it's called highly vulnerable children, HVC. And um, we've actually started a number of homes called Compassion Cottages in which kids who are at extreme risk get brought together and a, re a family is rebuilt. A mom, a loving uh, caregiver, steps in and says, yes, I'll raise these kids as if they're my own, and they become her own. You ask one of these kids, who's that woman? They'll, say, they'll look at you funny and they say, 
<laughs> that's mom. <laughs> what are you, crazy? And these are my brothers and sisters. So we have been working for the past few years to rebuild families for the kids at greatest risk. And I was visiting one of those homes, and I had a chance to visit with one of those moms and was asking about what's working and what's not and what's hard. And man, it's hard. These women who take this responsibility, they're taking kids who've come from very difficult backgrounds. And so pray for these moms. Uh, they are amazing people, and we were really our privilege to serve them. Well, after learning from one of them, I popped around the corner and was ready to head out. When, uh, you know, there's 250,000 kids in Africa, you really don't expect to run across the same one time. And, and uh, this is Isaac. Isaac had been selected. And I couldn't believe it. I, I told myself I wouldn't lose control now, but I lost control then, and it's not real good because... It's kind of scary when a white man comes up and starts bawling in front of you. <laughs> but there he was. This kid that I'd given up, given up hope for, and I shouldn't have, but uh, we went the last mile for Isaac, and it was the Highly Vulnerable Children program. And uh, I said, Isaac, I've come a very long way to get my picture taken with the smartest kid in the school. So I got this picture, and then I said, how are you doing in school? He's third in his class. His mom describes him as a charming kid. Now, briefly, I just need to say that I wish I had time to tell you. I mean, this is just an impossible chapel to talk about CIV because it's so massive. I wish I had time to tell you about Bibles in Thailand, about computer labs in Rwanda, about income generation in Uganda, this woman was given a $50 grant, a tiny amount of money. She was able to purchase these uh, different products and sell them in the market, and she'd been running that business for several months successfully and sustainably. Wish I could tell you about immunization programs in Indonesia, like this one. <laughs> the children are so grateful for CIV. <laughs> I wish I could tell you about latrines in Indonesia. I personally inspected this one. I wish I could tell you about malaria in Kenya. I have a slide here that's a data slide. I like data, I'm sorry, it's the kind of guy I am, but this is what I get excited about. Because this shows you that the end of fiscal year 04, we were surveying, uh, you know, when, when we are treating kids, kids who fall sick are referred to clinics and we pay the bills and we track. Why are they falling sick? And we want to learn from that so we can improve our programs. And in the end of fiscal year 04, 80% of the reasons for children visiting a clinic, of the causes for that, were due to malaria in Kenya. Now, by the end of FY05, that was 50%. End of FY06, that was 21%. And as of the end of FY07, we were below 20% on the incidence rate of malaria. This is among our kids. This isn't general data for the country. This is Compassion's Kids in Kenya. During that same period of time, we've distributed almost 200,000 insecticide-treated nets to stop mosquitoes from stealing the lives of our children. That is CIV, and that is also going the distance. It's not enough to distribute an insecticide-treated net and just drop the package off at the church. It takes going on home visits and helping them know how do you install it. It takes encouragement. It's a new thing, and not everybody's all that excited about sleeping under one but it saves lives. I wish I had time to tell you about our partnerships with Opportunity International, with Habitat for Humanity, the International Justice Mission. I'll briefly show you the financial scope on the next slide. What this shows you is the number of grants that have gone to the field, almost $18 million through February of this current fiscal year have gone to the field. That's just the grants side of that. Now, a little over a quarter of that is what we call program enhancement. We're talking about curriculum income generation, large-scale water projects, infrastructure development, disaster response, developing our church partners, orphans and vulnerable children or highly vulnerable children, uh, non-formal education, medical assistance, malaria, AIDS. This is amazing. This is a massive amount of work from boreholes to Bibles, <laughs> from immunizations to income generation. It's, it's an amazing amount of work that's going on here. And in the next slide, what if, if we were to annualize that and project over the next few months what this would look like, and I'm not saying that's appropriate because probably more of the money's already gone out, annualize that projection is $26 million for FY08. And if you add to that the administrative cost, the fundraising cost, the program delivery cost, really the real cost to our organization of delivering CIV, 
This current fiscal year looks like around $35 million. It is a massive program. And what's really amazing is that so many people kind of, oh yeah, well, we do some of that. This is big. So on the next slide, I have our scripture for today. This is from 2 Corinthians 8, verse 11. Now finish the work. Finish the work that your eager willingness to do so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. We have these outcomes. CIV exists to complete the mission, to complete the core programs. And as much as God gives us capacity to do so within our means, we're going to go the last mile for kids. Now, I was in a conversation the other day, and a a guy asked me a question. He said, well, isn't it enough just to feed a kid? That's a very important question for us. Why is it so important to finish? Why is it so important to go the last mile? Let me ask you, if you were raising up an army, would you give them guns but no bullets? Would you give them tanks but no gas? Will you give children literacy but not give them Jesus? That's like tanks with no gas. Because we are talking about raising up an army. We're talking about the fact that we've already enlisted over a million little partners in this advance for the king. We're talking about the vision that Compassion graduates will be Christians of influence within their communities. Why? Because this is transformational development. This is kingdom advancing work. We are building the children who will build the nations. They are salt and light now. Don't get me wrong, the million children that we're partnering with, and I like to look at it that way, are already salt and light in their communities, already advancing the kingdom, already doing amazing things. But they will grow to become adults who are also salt and light in their communities. They will build businesses that are trustworthy. They will become journalists who write with truth and with fairness. They will become the leaders. They will displace the corrupt leaders. You want to know how to address corruption and injustice in the developing world? Raise a generation of men and women of integrity who have the heart of servant leadership. One day, we will see a Compassion graduate be the president of his or her country. This is a lot more, amen, this is a lot more than just helping needy kids. Helping needy kids is good, but this is about giving a little girl who was born with a hole in her heart the chance of becoming president of Uganda. That is what it means to go the last mile. Now, as we finish today, I'd like to acknowledge and honor those among us who have really done the work. I'd I'd like to first of all acknowledge David Frunnerhouse. David Frunnerhouse has done amazing work leading a CIV project team that has greatly improved and, and laid a foundation for CIV in the future. And the work's not done. We have more to do. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Laura Fisher and all of U.S. Development because they are working to see, to witness miracles of fundraising. And the guys in finance, we've seen a lot of Martin Rediger and Dan Trumbull have been participating in all these different project meetings and really helping us understand CIV and improve the way that we relate CIV to the organization. And the MI2 team, you know, we have a CIV ministry cabinet for Allison and for Laura Fisher, Bob Thorpe, and Greg Keane. Uh, they have laid a foundation for CIV to achieve excellence well into the future, going the last mile for our kids. But in particular this morning, I'd like to invite the CIV team from International Program to come up and join me. So Greg Keene, Bob Thorpe, and Sharon LeMay, if you'd just come on up here. <clears throat> These guys, I, I, can't, I don't have time to tell you about how much endurance, how much perseverance it has taken for this team to go the last mile for kids over the past several years. And uh, come on out here, Sharon. I know this. You, you love being up here. I'm, I'm sure of that. And Bob. Um, these, these are heroes. And uh, they have been in the trenches for a long time. And so I have a gift for them. It's, uh, it's a thank you. And um, it's just a token. Uh, this, this gift is really about perseverance. So I'll step over here because I'm going to hand this to you. <clears throat> Would you join me? Just stand and applaud and, and uh, honor these guys.
as you look out and see this room, you see about 500 faces. I mean, uh, 500 faces, that's, it's kind of terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> some, some faces are more terrifying than others, too. <laughs> I want you to imagine, just blow the back wall off that auditorium and imagine for everyone standing here, there are two more of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are working in the field offices around the world for these kids. And I want you to imagine them being here with us because if they were here, they would be applauding and they would be honoring you. And that, that crowd would flow out into the parking lot and up probably to Voyager and you'd see that sea. And then I want you, if you can, to imagine that behind that, of those almost 5,000 church partners that we have, we have about 20,000 other brothers and sisters in Christ who are committed to serving these kids. And your work has been a blessing to them, and they've been able to do things in the lives of kids because of your work. They are there. And if you could see that sea of 20,000 more project workers and volunteers and tutors, they would go across the parking lots and fill into the Chinese restaurant across there. <laughs> and if you could see it, if we had the million little partners with us today, they would fill the landscape to the horizon and beyond. And you would hear a million little voices saying thank you. And that's what's written on this. It says to Greg Keane, Bob Thorpe, Sharon LeMay, Heidi Partlow, a million little voices say thank you for your perseverance in CIV. The work, is, the work is not done. There is, we're, we've been going through revolutionary change. So I'm asking you, please continue to pray for this team. And any way you can come alongside of them to support them and encourage them and, and finance. I know that there's today a deadline on getting out vouchers or something like that. So if you could give a little grace uh, <laughs> since they're here. Um, anyway, it's been a great privilege to work alongside of you guys and enable uh, this ministry to kids.